welcome to Y24 News Sports Weekend Edition with some of the best stories we had in our magazine this past week. We begin with the Handball World Cup that ended this past Sunday. There's no surprise in the fact that France won the title again. They have been world champions five times in the past 20 years. It's a completely different story when you look at the other team that made it to the finals. Qatar never had been a major handball nation, but that did not stop them from hosting the event and finishing as runners-up. How do they do it? It's easy when you have the money for it. No less than 11 players out of the 16 that make the team come from foreign countries, some with a history in other national teams, and suddenly they found it convenient to become Qatari citizens and play for their new homeland. Though it may be a legitimate practice according to international handball rules, it left many with an uncomfortable feeling. Liz Barabom and Shai Benari with a story. Qatar's efforts seem to be bearing fruit. Despite losing to France in the finals, the hosts of the World Handball Championship proved to the world that they can compete against the top countries. The team fight, fight totally. And I am very happy. This is a success for it's the first team that arrived in the semi-final, not European. On the other side, the French handball coach recognizes the merit of the young Qatari team. I think they believed at the competition, they believed it was possible, and they almost achieved the performance in the end, so congratulations to the work of Valero and congratulations to the Qatari team. But the road to the success was long. The state led by Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani has worked hard to host major competitions. In 2010, they were awarded the 2022 World Cup. A milestone in the history of the Middle East and a milestone for FIFA. So thank you again. Thank you very much. And we hope to make this dream a final reality and we hope to see you in the opening match. Despite suspicions of corruption, he is not about to withdraw from the competition at the moment. For its handball side, Qatar has utilized a very intriguing policy. Of the 16 players who make up Qatar's team, only five are Qatari. The other 11 come from the four corners of the globe, including Frenchman Bertrand Ronet. Those handball players were attracted by adventure and money and came despite the risk of criticism. So they are a bit on a cloud. We will try to take them down from the cloud. It's not the first time Qatar has done something like this. In athletics, Kenyan Stefan Chirono became world champion in 2003 after becoming a naturalized Qatari citizen in exchange for a life of wealth. He is now called Saeed Shaif Shaheen. But not all of Qatar's attempts have always worked. In 2011, Mohammed bin Hammam failed to be elected president of FIFA. He was even banned for life from all football-related activities. The official Mr. bin Hammam is hereby banned from taking part in any kind of football-related activity at national and international level, administrative, sports, and any other for life. But the failures are there. The 2017 World Athletics Championships were awarded to London despite a whopping budget, and the Qatar bid for the 2020 Olympics has not passed the screening of the IOC. What will happen with the 2022 World Cup infrastructure, which has cost 130 billion euros and thousands of lives? Just pay the right money and everyone will become Qatari. Now to a completely different story. There's a reason why Serena Williams and Novak Djokovic hold the first place in the WTA and ATP for so long. This week, they proved us all once again that they are the best in the world. Both number ones won their respective Australian Open titles, and they were not the only ones to find success this week. Here's Michael Friedman with our Stars of the Week. With exciting finals this week around the world, who is your favorite winner? Serena Williams, Novak Djokovic, Team Australia, or the New England Patriots? Serena Williams took on Maria Sharapova in the 2015 Australian Open Finals in a stellar match. The American star extended her winning streak against the Russian to 16 in a row. The world number one has now surpassed her childhood heroes Chris Evert and Martina Navratilova and is only three matches behind Steffi Graf, who holds 22 majors. After the win, Serena was jumping up and down in celebration and Navratilova was there to hand the trophy to the champion. Novak Djokovic. And moving to the men's tennis champion, Novak Djokovic captured another Grand Slam title. Australia has proven to be a successful place for the Serbian. The world number one took on Andy Murray, and this gave him his fifth title in Oz. While the first two sets proved competitive, Djokovic would go on to win in three hours and 39 minutes and held the trophy high in the air. 
still down under, the Asian Cup final was played in Sydney with the host country fans showing their colors. While the Koreans had not let in a goal in the entire tournament, Massimo Longo had a beautiful strike to put his side ahead. The Koreans were resilient with a late equalizer, but it wasn't enough as the Socceroos claimed their first Asian Cup title winning 2-1 in extra time. Team Australia were crowned the new kings of Asian football. And moving across to the United States, the biggest event of the year took place when the New England Patriots defeated the Seattle Seahawks 28-24 in Super Bowl 49. This epic event came down to the wire and the Patriots were able to survive to give Tom Brady and Bill Belichick a fourth NFL championship together. The newspapers were already printed reading Champs Again and all the players were celebrating this emotional victory. Of the four big winners this week, Serena Williams captured her 19th Grand Slam. Novak Djokovic took his eighth title. The Socceroos won the Asian Cup and the New England Patriots won the Super Bowl. So pick your favorite champion of the week. And Michael is here with us. Hi, Michael. Hi. Let's start by, by looking at the tennis players, the both number ones. Now, Serena, she has 19 Grand Slams. Steffi Graf has 22. Margaret Court has 24. If she's still around for two or three years playing like this, she may become the number one. It's very possible. Uh, she's 33 years old, so age is a factor. But if, sh if she stays healthy, there's no reason why not. Uh, she has unbelievable stats. Uh, the last 23 of the 24 matches she she's played, she has won, which is phenomenal. And the last 11 finals, she's won 11 of the 11. So this player is someone who's just shined match after match, year after year. So she's she would love to, to, to break the record and have the most. So I hope for her sake that she can do that. Very, very interesting to see. And just thinking that she left players like Martina Navartilova and Chris Everett, the legends of women tennis behind is, is amazing. Yes. Now let's turn to the men's. Novak Djokovic, five titles in Melbourne. For the past seven years, there have only been two times in which Novak Djokovic was not the champion. And, and looking the way that he is, this will go on. He's, he's, he's not 33. He still has many years to go. He's the, there's a reason why he's the world number one. He's playing phenomenal tennis right now. He just started the new year on the right foot. And for him, this was a very important win. He now joins Andre Agassi, Jimmy Connors, uh, Ivan uh, Lendl, who big are names, big names, big names. So there's there's more for him as well, and he he hopes to 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 ride this out for the rest of the year and and really bring out you know the French Open, uh, U.S. Open. He wants he wants to win it all. Because I think we, we usually we spoke of him together with Rafa Nadal and Federer. I think he's now setting himself on a league of his own. Let's turn now to to football or soccer, we should say, because that's what they call it in Australia. Uh, back in 2005, Australia made a big decision. We don't want to play in Oceania anymore. We want to play in Asia. Ever since, they played in all the World Cups. They made it to the uh, uh, Asian final in 2007. In 2011, they won it now. They have upgraded their football, absolutely. It was a great move by them to go to Asia. It's far more competitive. It's better football. It's better for the country. You do get better when you play Japan, South Korea, and Iran than when you do when you play New Zealand and... and Papua New Guinea. The, the stronger your competitors, the stronger you play. We see this with, with all teams in the world. Whenever they're going up against the best teams, it brings out the best in them. Uh, and this as well, financially, was a huge, huge win. Uh, they're going to get so much uh, money, about $12 million, uh, they're saying, from naming rights for the Socceroos. So for them, it's promising with that. And for, for the country as well, like they want to... They want them to go on and say that they are, you know, this is just the beginning and there's more for them to come in the future. Yes, and, and you see their, their names of many players in England, in the Premier League. And they're looking at Russia 2018, and this, this team is uh, a very promising uh, opportunity for them in a few years. I wouldn't be surprised to see them in Russia, going far in Russia. We'll speak uh, about the Super Bowl a bit later on. Michael Friedman, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you may have thought the medieval period is over, but in some places we're still deep in the Middle Ages. Tens of knights recreated the days of the Crusaders in the Israeli city of Rishon LeZion last week for the second international tournament of medieval knight fighting. And it was almost as intense as it was a thousand years ago. Sasha Rubo and Michael Friedman bring us a story. It is in the arena at Rishon LeZion where the energy is exploding. 
Israeli champions prepare to face opponents from around the world in medieval battles. The Israelis matched up against the French, Danish, Russian, and Belarusian who came to defend the honor of their country. Armed with swords, axes, spears, and shields, they were all dressed in armor. The fighters came out to a crowd of passionate fans to watch them duel. In total, seven Israeli knights challenged seven different nations looking to become the one true champion. And for some contenders, these duels mean more than just the thrill of victory, as these fights represent something much greater. In Israel, we have to know it's the center of major crusades in the past. It's a symbolic place for medieval fighters. To come and fight here is to live the story. Among the Knights, some really loved the medieval era and always wanted to become a member of the Knights Watch. While others started this martial art later in life, they're all happy to have taken part in this sport. It was by accident, more or less, uh, on YouTube, I found a clip, and uh, right away it was something I had to try, and once I tried it, it was, I was hooked. No regrets so far, I've broken a finger, but uh, accidents happen, but uh, no, I'm very happy with the sport. Despite what many believe, men are not the only ones that can be knights, as seen with the presence of the Israeli champion, Ira. One of the members of the national team, she has been practicing with steady pace for several years. We train physical, we train skill, we train uh, different kind of fights, two times a week. Ira would also like to see more girls practicing this art she loves, and for it to open up the doors to others. I wish it would be more girls in Israel to fight with, and then we can make our own uh, team for uh, five versus five. But for now, I have to fight with the boys, and it's okay. While the fights are longer than expected, the fans remain faithful to watch the duels until the end. The fights got even more intense and some people even got injured. Despite everything, their desire remains intact and the losers are already preparing to come back next year to reconquer the lost crowns. They all seek to bring honor to their nations and wear the colors with pride. And now we turn our attention to the major event that was in America this week, probably the biggest there is in American sports, the Super Bowl of course. And here with me to talk about this is Marav Sabir, who had the luck to watch it in New York, so he didn't have to wake up in the crazy hours of the morning like we no, did. No, but we're New Yorkers, so we're not really big fans of the mm. New England Patriots. So yes, we didn't have yeah. that good of a night. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't very happy at the end. I want to ask you this. Everyone is still talking about the final play. They, should, they shouldn't, have, shouldn't have passed. All right. Let's mention the play before, the crazy catch that brought the Seahawks within, within 20 seconds of winning this match. If you're a Patriots fan, you're, all the demons are back again from seven years ago, Super Bowl 42. I don't think it's only if you're a Patriots fan. I'm a Giants fan, and I was having flashbacks to that 2007 season. Yes, where they yes, were let it happen no, again. Absolutely. David Tyree, <laughs> the helmet catch, and became so famous that within 30 seconds, you were seeing on Twitter everybody posting it's David Tyree version 2, how this is happening again. But not only that, in 2000 and, uh, 2011 season, the Patriots played the Giants again in the Super Bowl, and it was Mario Manningham who had an insane catch on the sidelines, tiptoeing, caught it with his fingers. So not only 2007, but 2011, this keeps happening to them in the past two Super Bowl appearances that I can't imagine what was going through Tom Brady's head when he saw that. It was a not-again moment where you just don't know what's going to happen next. And when I saw them on that, what was it, a yard line, I thought, that's it, game over. Seattle's taking a second consecutive win I don't think anybody expected that interception. Absolutely awful play calling. And uh, Pete Carroll did take responsibility for it after the game, saying it was my call. You can't blame the, te the team for it. And if you saw the reactions on the sidelines, they were priceless from both teams. Now, you mentioned these, these two losses by the Patriots to the Giants. Is, is this the, the sort of redemption? Because if you are from New England, there's nothing worse than losing twice in a row to, to the Giants of all, of all the teams. If you don't want to lose someone, that's a team from New York. Is this the redemption? I don't know if I'd call it a redemption. I think it's more of a sigh of relief. You've been here twice in the past 10 years and you weren't able to make it out with a Super Bowl ring. And this is Tom Brady that we're talking about, one of the best quarterbacks in the league, if not the best, some would argue, that you're coming at us and you're saying, oh my God, it almost happened again. We almost lost it in the last minute. We could have gone back in 10 years, three Super Bowl appearances and nothing to show for it. And I, it's a sigh of relief. The Seattle Seahawks slipped up. They were able to get that interception, which is also something absolutely incredible. I mean, it could have been a, just a, a non-catch, but it happened to be interception that they probably I could you could see Tom Brady on that sideline so excited throwing was, his hands was, in the he air. He was thrilled. I saw that. It's not happening to me again. <laughs> now, if, if we look at the Seahawks, they're obviously disappointed. But two two Super Bowls in a row, three in ten years. 
that, that, that's sort of how you build a legacy. Absolutely. And they do have last year, they had that incredible game last year. You can't even compare the way these two Super Bowls have gone. Last year, they absolutely destroyed the Devon Broncos. It was amazing. We were sitting here in shock of what had happened. This year, then. much better game, but obviously they couldn't come out of it with a win. But like you said, three Super Bowl appearances in just 10 years. Pete Carroll seems to be moving this team in the right direction. And we're all very Looks excited to see next them. year. Marshawn Lynch, Richard Sherman, it's not over. They've got a lot, plenty more to come. Absolutely, and we'll follow them next season. Rob Severe, thank you very much. Thank you. And that's it for this weekend edition. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye.